Roosevelt. It's amazing to me that when we hear the name Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we should immediately think China. It was what, one of the major influences in, in young FDR's life. His mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, grew up in a mansion in Hong Kong. Sarah Delano Roosevelt was the one who paid Franklin's bills. Franklin Roosevelt never had uh, any big high paying jobs. He was a public servant most of his life. But he had yachts, he had townhouses in New York, summer place up in Maine. Where did that money come from? It came from the Delano line. Where did the Delanos get the money? Grandpa Warren Delano was the American opium king of China. He was the biggest American opium dealer. So it's as if the Cali cartel shoving cocaine into the United States grew a president of, of Colombia. Now, people are surprised Warren Delano was an opium dealer, a, a criminal in the eyes of, of, the, of the Chinese. And some people think this is just a little slice of, an unusual slice of history that I've picked out, but it isn't. If you, if you go all over the East Coast, you'll see the influence of opium fortunes. Look at, go to the campus at Yale University. The, uh, the, the tomb, which is the headquarters for the Skull and Bones Society, is on the campus of Yale University. That tomb is still financially supported by the Russell Trust. Warren Delano worked for the Russell family. It was the Russell company that he worked for, the biggest opium dealers in China. This is, Yale is built on land uh, donated by uh, opium barons. The number one most famous building on Columbia's campus is the Lowe Library. That's named after Abbott Lowe, who dealt opium with Warren Delano out there in China. Princeton University's first big, big benefactor was Stephen Green. Stephen Green took over Russell and Company's opium operations after Warren Delano returned back to the United States a rich man. America's first manufacturing city, Lowell, Lowell, Massachusetts, was founded by opium money. The first railroads in the East Coast, opium money. Uh, Ralph Waldo M. Emerson, the great transcendentalist, how come he had so much time to sit around and think? Because he married into an opium fortune. The Council on Foreign Relations, the Coolidge family, opium, Chiquita Banana, AT&T. Scratch the history of anybody with the name Forbes in their name, like Secretary of State John Forbes Carey, and you'll see an opium fortune. His great-grandfather was an opium dealer. So, you know, when the Chinese talk about 100 years of humi humiliation, this is what they're talking about. We were shoving opium uh, under the uh, guys, uh, under the eyes of the British, French, and the United States navies. Warren Delano was counsel out there in Canton and welcomed the first Navy ships, U.S. Navy ships, to participate in the first opium war. Uh, go over to Canton, which is Guangzhou now, and you'll see statues uh, uh, celebrating the man who asked Warren Delano to please stop a smuggling opium. Go to New York's Chinatown. You'll see the Chinese Americans have, elected, have erected two statues to their heroes. One is to Confucius. The other one is to, the, is to Commissioner Lin, the official that asked Warren Delano to give up uh, his opium stocks. So now Certainly a significant portion of the trade that Russell Sturgis was in was opium. I do not pretend to justify the prosecution of the opium trade from a moral and philanthropic point of view, but as a merchant I insist that it is a fair, honorable, and legitimate trade. I considered it right to follow the example of England, Vidya Company, and the merchants to whom I had always been accustomed to look up, the Perkins the Peabody's, the Russell's, and the Lowe's. The Perkins, the Peabody's, the Russell's, and the Lowe's were the first families of 19th century Boston. 
The money they made in the China trade helped build America, funding the railroads that took America west, endowing universities like Princeton, and paying for much of the research of Alexander Graham Bell. The China trade also established American missionaries in China. Peter Parker founded a hospital in Canton. Other missionaries, like the German Karl Gutzlaff, took a different approach. Gutzlaff served as a guide and interpreter on the Scottish opium boats of the Jardine Matheson Company. Oh, Gutzlaff, he must have been a very interesting character. Uh, he was a loner, he was ambitious. I don't doubt his Christian convictions, but he was interpreter for merchants, and he would help distribute Bibles off one side of the ship while opium went off the other side. Gutzlaff's employers were James Matheson, a Scottish financier, and William Jardine, a ship surgeon. In an early company bulletin, the Opium Circular, Jardine gushed about the financial promise of the illegal trade. If the trade is ever legalized, it will cease to become profitable from that time. The more difficulties that attend it, the better for you and for us. Jardine Matheson and their fellow traders devised a very clever scheme to smuggle their opium. From Macau, the opium traders would sail up to a deserted island called Lintin, Solitary Nail. At Lintin, protected by gunboats, the opium was transferred into storage ships, where it waited like groceries on a shelf for customers from Canton to claim it. On decks choking with balls of opium and silver, Chinese middlemen bought their drugs. They smuggled them back to shore in boats called fast crabs or scrambling dragons. For the foreign merchants, there was almost no risk involved. Sales were pleasantness and remittances were peace. Transactions seemed to partake of the nature of the drug. They imparted a soothing frame of mind and no bad debts. We are not smugglers, gentlemen. It is the Chinese government, it is the Chinese officers who smuggle and connive at and encourage smuggling, not we. Whoever was responsible, there was no denying the effects, as Edward Delano discovered years later in an opium den he visited in Singapore. One man was prostrate under its effects, pale, cadaverous, and death-like in appearance. He was quite insensible to touch, for when I took his pipe from his hands, he offered no resistance, though his eyes tried to follow me. By 1835, over two million Chinese were addicted to opium. The lower classes took to it because they found it stimulating and kept them at work longer than the, the, the undernourished people could have coped with the kind of work, workloads they had. So opium sort of eased their pain. The, upper classes were greatly affected by it in a way very much like today it's the middle class and above the people who had the money the young bright children of such families were the ones that took to it and they destroyed the uh, the basis of that already rather thin literati class that provide the ruling elites of china the emperor's court was extremely worried but what did they do well, some people said, conventionally, of course, let's just punish all the opium smugglers. The others said, let's punish both the sm smugglers and the opium eaters. A third group said, why not legalize opium? In fact, well, the solutions they suggested were strikingly similar to the solutions uh, proffered to solve the drug problem in the United States a century later. In this film, produced in 1959, the communist government of China told its version of the opium war.
，便宜破产了。这是中国人民不能容忍的。The hero of this film is an incorruptible official named Lin Zexu. Lin Zexu, 我派你为钦差大臣。The Manchu Emperor appointed Lin High Commissioner, a virtual drug czar, with the power of the empire to stop the Canton opium trade. Chen, Lin Zhi.